Hi there, and welcome to this installment of my ongoing series on Christianity and Liberalism by J. Gresham Machen. Perhaps at this point you've recently watched my video introducing J. Gresham Machen's classic work, and you're ready to read it for the first or second or third time. That's great. It will be well worth your time, I'm confident. But before you begin, let me suggest that you familiarize yourself with four of the book's key themes so that you're looking for them and you don't miss these important aspects of Machen's thinking. Whenever you read a book defending historic Christianity, you'd expect to see a few recurring themes, like the gospel or the deity of Christ, for example. These kinds of themes are certainly in Christianity and liberalism, too. But the themes we'll look at today are more unique to Machen's approach to defending Christianity. He repeatedly brings these up at different points in his arguments, and not just in this book. These all permeate his other writings as well. So it's no exaggeration to say that understanding Machen on these four themes will help you understand some of Machen's uniqueness as a Reformed thinker. So what are the four themes? They are sin, history, experience, and deception. So that spells shed. Uh, don't complain. I'm not a pastor after all, so I never took the seminary class on how to put together a memorable acronym. Uh, I'll just put a picture of a woodshed on the screen perhaps, and maybe that will help you remember. All right, so let's start with sin, or more specifically, the consciousness of sin. In fact, I've already done a video, an extended video on this one, uh, because the theme is so pervasive in Machen's works. But to put it briefly, Machen is convinced that an individual's acceptance of Christianity depends on a deep personal conviction of sin. Without it, the intellect is blinded by deep-seated opposition to supernaturalism and will never see the need for a supernatural savior. But once we are convicted of sin, it becomes obvious that only the supernatural can free us from our bondage. So, for example, in chapter 5 of this book, Machen writes, Without the conviction of sin, there can be no appreciation of the uniqueness of Jesus. It is only when we contrast our sinfulness with his holiness that we appreciate the gulf which separates him from the rest of the children of men. And without the conviction of sin, there can be no understanding of the occasion for the supernatural act of God. Without the conviction of sin, the good news of redemption seems to be an idle tale. We might ask, where does this consciousness of sin come from? In chapter 3, Machen argues for the importance of proclaiming the law of God in both word and deed, but concludes that the conviction of sin can be produced only by the Spirit of God. The second theme that I'll address here is what I've called history, or if we state that more fully, Machen's argument that Christianity is a religion based on historical facts and the interpretation of those facts, especially the death and resurrection of Jesus. On the other hand, Machen's liberal opponents contended that Christianity was best understood as a life or an experience, and that the doctrines derived from such experience were necessarily transitory, never binding on subsequent generations. To Machen, this is simply an abandonment of the search for truth, because truth is eternal and does not change with the passage of generations. As he famously put it in a speech that he gave in 1927, there is one good thing about facts. They stay put. If a thing really happened, the passage of years can never possibly make it into a thing that did not happen. If the body of Jesus really emerged from the tomb on the first Easter morning, then no possible advance of science can change that fact one whit. To make his case, Machen marshals a variety of evidence to demonstrate that Jesus was supernatural, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and that his disciples started a religious movement based on these facts and their meaning. Machen's view of the importance of historical facts and doctrines directly relates to his view of Christian experience and life, another one of the themes that run through this and many other writings by Machen. He argues in chapter 4 that liberals put too much emphasis on experience, saying that their religion is founded upon the shifting emotions of sinful men. For them, experience is primary, and only what helps the individual man is true. Machen writes, Such an authority is obviously no authority at all, for individual experience is endlessly diverse. And when once truth is regarded only as that which works at any particular time, it ceases to be truth. The result is an abysmal skepticism. For Machen, on the other hand, belief in Christian doctrine comes first, founded on an unchanging authority. 
the Bible. Out of it flows Christian experience and life. The Christian transformed by faith now has a new life, and his experience of peace and freedom from guilt confirms the validity of his faith. The last theme that we'll discuss here, deception, may seem like a strange thing for Machen to emphasize, but it becomes clear upon reading this and many of Machen's other works. He contends that his opponents deliberately deceive others in order to re retain their positions of power and influence in the church. By doing so, says Machen, they lead their parishioners astray. For example, Machen argues that liberals use traditional terms like God, but attach different meanings to them. This allows them to say things like Jesus is God that sound orthodox to the layperson, but actually intend something different, more like Jesus is the highest ideal in the world. To Machen, this is simply untruthful when spoken to the layperson who associates the word God with the teaching of the Bible. Machen insists that this deception is by no means necessary or warranted. These liberals who oppose historic Christian doctrine are perfectly free to join another church, where their views would be accepted. But instead, they choose to remain as leaders in the Presbyterian Church, in which they have subscribed to a body of doctrine, the Westminster Standards, that they do not uphold. So as you read Christianity and Liberalism, look for these themes. The consciousness of sin the historical basis for Christianity, the Christian experience, and the evil of deception. You'll notice at least two or three of them in most chapters of the book. They are an important part of what makes this book and its author unique and worthy of our attention. Thanks for watching this video in this series on the book Christianity and Liberalism. Lord willing, in future videos in this series, we'll explore the content of each chapter of the book as a supplement to your own reading. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss them. Thanks.